I want us to begin a series this morning. And what I want us to see as we study and look, God willing, into the book of Jonah, I want us to see the God of compassion. That is what the book of Jonah is mainly about. When you think of the book of Jonah, a lot of people think of Jonah, they think of a wayward prophet, they think of a well, and that's about it. And there's a lot of truth in that. But any time you read the book of Jonah, just turn over to chapter 4 very briefly, keep verse 2 in your mind. Verse 2 is, is something like the Apostle John writing at the end of the Gospel of John why he wrote the Gospel of John. It's something like the Apostle John writing in 1 John several different times why he wrote the book of 1 John. Jonah, as it were, tells us what this book is about in verse 2. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. And here it is. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. That is the message of the book of Jonah. It's the character of God. It's who God is. It's, it's who, not that He becomes or something sinful that people may think of God. It's who He has always been. He's a God of compassion. He's a God of mercy. He revealed Himself to Moses in this kind of language. And He reveals Himself again over and over and over in the book of Jonah as a God of compassion. And what I want us to do today is focus on chapter 1. And I want us to focus on these first three verses that we read earlier today. And what I want us to think about today is God's compassion to rebels. God's compassion to rebels. Jonah is a prophet. He is also a rebel. And we're going to see something of the many ways, but something today, of how God showed compassion to Jonah and how God has shown compassion to us over and over and over as Christians. I want us to see three things today. First, I want us to see Jonah's wickedness. Secondly, I want you to see Jonah's sin described. And then thirdly, I want us to see how God showed mercy and compassion to Jonah. Let's start here. Let's start in verse 1. I'm going to turn very briefly and just read one verse from 2 Kings, and we'll go right back to verse 1. 2 Kings is something of an introduction, we may say, to the book of Jonah. It describes who he is. Jonah lived around the year 770 B.C. It was in the time of Jeroboam II, king of Israel. It was at the beginning of Uzziah's reign as king of Judah. Jonah, some think, though it's not... Provable, some think that Jonah may have been one of the sons of the prophets. You remember that group of prophets at around the time of Elisha there? They, he, Jonah came just after Elisha and Elijah. And some think maybe he was one of the young men learning and, and learning from the great prophets of God. Whatever the case is, we see in the Bible that Jonah is a true prophet. He is a true servant. He loves God. He obeys God. We can say this looking back, Jonah's a Christian. He's not a fake Christian. He's not a hypocrite, though he's certainly acting as one in the book of Jonah. But he knew the Lord truly. Just listen to this one verse, then I'll turn right back to Jonah 1. He restored the border of Israel, that's speaking of Jeroboam the king, from the entrance of Hamath as far as the sea of the Arabah. According to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which He spoke through His servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was of Gath Hefer. What I want us to see at the very beginning this morning is the wickedness of Jonah. Before we talk about compassion, there has to be something to be compassionate over, right? What we have here is not simply someone who doesn't know God, they have no Bible in their hands, and they go off and they sin as all men in that condition do. As bad as that is, we're dealing with something this morning 
far worse. Why was Jonah's sin so wicked? Why was it so terrible in the sight of God? We've seen two reasons so far. One, he's a servant of God. The word servant can point to the fact that there is one especially called and attention has been brought to the Lord Jesus like in the servant songs of Isaiah that He was the servant of the Lord. He had a special calling of God on His life to carry out. Jonah was a servant. And now he's acting like a servant of sin in Jonah 1. It says there in, in 2 Kings that Jonah was a prophet. A prophet is one specially commissioned by God before birth to carry out the will of God, to carry out the commands of God, to go and preach. And now not only do you have Jonah not preaching, as we're going to see in just a little bit, you have Jonah around sinners and he cares nothing for their souls. Then turn and then look back in verse 1 of chapter 1. Now we'll begin here. Why else was Jonah's sin so wicked? The word of the Lord came to Jonah. It is a special thing to have the word of the Lord brought to someone. 400 years had gone by. Not a word from God. And then a man in the wilderness named John the Baptist, the Bible says, and the word of the Lord came to him. It is a special thing to have God's Word given in the Bible to a man to preach, to prophesy. And a word has come to Jonah and he said, no, I'm not going to do it. That's a very terrible sin. Verse 2, what is God's command to Jonah? Arise, he says to Jonah. And Jonah does arise. Look in verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee. God says to Jonah, I want you to rise up. I want you to go out and carry off my commands to other men and women. And Jonah does rise up and he goes the other way and sins. Instead of rising up and obeying, Jonah rose up and sinned. This is a terrible sin that Jonah has committed here. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. Later on in this book, you see that one of the reasons that God has compassion on these wicked men, my understanding is, in Nineveh, listen, gross immorality and sin didn't start in 2022. In the year 770 B.C., my understanding is this, the Assyrians skinned men alive. It didn't start in our generation. Men have always been wicked and evil. He says, go to this great city. And yet, even though this city is wicked, one of the reasons God has mercy on this city, later in this book, He says there's 120,000 people who do not know their left hand from their right hand. What's that mean? He says in this city, probably not within the walls, but in the surrounding area as well, within this city, God says, there's 120,000 children who don't know right from wrong yet. I'm going to have compassion on these people. And here you have is God saying, I want you to go there. And Jonah is neglecting not only the commandment of God, he is neglecting the people who need the Word of God. Jonah is supposed to be a watchman. He is supposed to be somebody standing on the wall and crying out for sinners to turn. And yet what you see is Jonah, he is turning himself away from God. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. He is to preach to them. He is to cry out. Preaching is a crying out. It's not a lecturing. I don't always preach this way, I know. And everybody doesn't have to preach like I do or Brother Danny or other people do. The fact of the matter is this. Preaching is not teaching purely. It's not lecturing. It's a crying out. It's a coming down upon. You can bring notes, you can bring all these things, and yet if God doesn't come down with His Spirit, there's no preaching. Verse 3, why is Jonah's sin so wicked? But Jonah rose up to flee. 
Do you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to run to obey God. Jesus was hungry one day and they came to Him. They said, "Have you? do you have anything to eat? And He said, I've got food you know not of to do God's will. Joseph in the Old Testament fled from sexual sin. Paul in the New Testament tells us, flee from sexual immorality. And here what we have is Jonah fleeing to go sin. To go do wrong. This is is a serious sin that he's committing here. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. He's to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is... Nineveh is the enemies of Israel. Some of the enemies of Israel, it's in the northeast. Tarshish is in somewhere in the southwest. Jonah's doing just the opposite of what God has called him to do here. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish, and here is the great sin. From the presence of the Lord. To flee, now we may use what he's saying here in a different way at times today, because it can be taken in a different way. We want the presence of God, don't we? For Jonah to flee the presence of God meant in one sense he knew the presence of God. Jonah's a Christian. He's not a hypocrite. He knows God. And what we find here is Jonah is fleeing from the presence of God. And look what it says in verse 3. It's the author. I I believe it's Jonah, though uh, the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us that, I suppose. Look at how the the inspired author is describing this, this instance in Jonah's life, this sin in Jonah's life. He is to arise. He is to obey God. He is to go up to Nineveh. He is to go northeast. He is to go and preach to these pagans. And yet the Bible says here, so he went down. He went down. He went down. It's a lesson for all of us when you're reading the Bible and you see the inspired authors using the same words in a close proximity. They're trying to tell us something. Jonah went down to Joppa, which is down, which is southwest, away from Nineveh found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare. He's using God's money to sin now. The money, maybe some poor church member or, or, or Israelite or someone in Judah had maybe given as a gift, Jonah possibly now is using it to sin against God and the people of Nineveh. Paid the fare, and here it is again, and went down into it to go with them. Who is them? It's the unbelievers that he's going to be sailing with. It's those people who did not trust in Yahweh completely. They trust in other gods. Jonah is supposed to go with sinners, but now he's going with sinners and he's going to act like them and be like them. And went down into, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. And here it is again from the presence of the Lord. And then look in verse 5. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. Jonah, instead of going up, kept going down, down, down. We're not going to look at it today, but then he was what? Thrown into the sea to go down and swallowed by a fish. The ways of the wicked are hard. They're hard. So we see here at the very beginning the wickedness of Jonah's sin. It's, it's not as if, it's not as if he's a, and you know what I mean, I think, when I say this, a regular sinner. As, as bad as that is, he knows God. He has all this knowledge of God. He has, and and for us today, we have access to the Bible as no one's ever had. I mean, I mean, honestly, how many Bibles do we have with us today? I'll tell you. 
it would be almost impossible to count. Because on our phone, we can look at a hundred translations today. We have it with us all the time. We can either even ride in our cars and have the Bible read to us as we, as we drive. We can listen to sermons as we drive. We, uh, we have more Bibles. We have more sermons. We have more opportunity than ever before. There are people today in other parts of the world who would give everything they have to have this right here in their own language. And we, like Jonah, have great judgment if we turn away from that because we have great opportunity. That's the wickedness of Jonah's sin. Here's what I want you to see secondly this morning. Is Jonah's sin described? We've, we've talked a little bit about this, but this is different. Jonah's sin described. I'm going to describe it in five or six ways or so. The first way is this. Jonah's sin is inexcusable. It's inexcusable. You take a man or a woman, they are hungry. It's not that they have maybe wasted things. They simply don't have food and they still to eat, and they plan to repay it. That's We can talk about that, but that's what, what I'm saying is this. To some degree, we could say that's much more excusable than someone just simply sinning and stealing because he likes to steal. Augustine used to take fruit off of his neighbor's trees, even though I believe the fruit on his own tree was better. He just liked to steal. The sin of Jonah is inexcusable. Secondly, this. The sin of Jonah this morning, and this is terrifying, it's willful. It's willful. When we begin to talk about willful sin, we are entering into dangerous territory. One of the reasons the Apostle Paul said that God had mercy on him, he says in 2 Timothy, is because... God had mercy upon me because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Jonah's not acting this way. Jonah is acting with full light. He's acting with full knowledge. Listen, don't sin on purpose. That is a dangerous thing to do against God. Jonah knows the way. He knows what he's supposed to be doing. He has light. He has knowledge. And he does it anyway. That is wicked sin. His sin, we would call it this. His sin is grievous. It's grievous. Listen, I don't know everyone's background here. I know this, that God can forgive any sin if someone will come to Him in repentance. But you think about the sin of adultery. You think of that, that precious, sacred, holy covenant made between a man and a woman. The trust that is built over the years, the love that is nurtured and grows over the years, and then one day for that to be broken is infidelity. That's a grievous sin. What we have here is a, a man of God, a prophet. He is close to God. The closer we become to God, the worse our sin is. The closer we get to God, I believe at least, that's one reason that when Moses sinned with the rock, God said, you're not entering into the promised land because Moses was so close to God. And if I may say this, it broke the heart of God. Jonah was a man close to God. And he sinned. His sin is grievous. Grievous this morning. His sin is endangering this morning. What I mean by that is, in this first chapter, we see Jonah, he is neglecting. This is the mistake people, people make. They think our sin, the sin that we commit, they think our sin only affects the people, or only affects us, is what we think. My sin is my business. What I do with my life is my business. I may be disobeying God, I understand that, but guess what? I may be disobeying God, but it's only me. It's on me. It's not on anybody else. That's a lie. 
Jonah's sin not only affected him, it affected the people he was supposed to preach to. Jonah's sin not only affected him, it affected the unbelievers on that ship and the captain had to come down and rebuke the prophets for sleeping when they were in such danger. Our sin never only affects us. Our sin always endangers other people. Because if we're not the people we ought to be, then we cannot be the witness we ought to be to other people. Let me read a little bit to you from a testimony from a pastor from Brooklyn many years ago. And he, and this is just a very short amount of what was written about this. this. You have a young man, he's in his 20s, he's on his deathbed, or at least they think he's on his deathbed. His father is a universalist. His father thinks everybody's going to get saved. And he has taught his son that. That everybody's going to be saved one day. His son is talking about his worldliness on his deathbed. He's, he's extremely disturbed. This is a real story. And his father says this to him. Why, you need not feel so bad. You have never done any hurt to anybody. This is what his son says to him. Don't talk to me, father, said he at a tone of authority or rather of hatred and anger. You have been my worst enemy. You have ruined me. You led me to disobey God and neglect the Bible. You led me into sin when I was only a little boy. You took me off to fish and hunt and stroll around the fields on Sundays when mother wanted me to go to church. You told me there was no hell, that all men would be saved. And don't come here now to try to deceive me any longer. You have done your work. You have been my ruin. Oh, if I had minded mother and not you, I should not have come to such an end. Let that, and there's much more we could say about that story, let that put an end to the thought that our sin is just our sin. Our sin affects everyone. If we're disobedient, you know what that's going to affect? That will affect our family members that we may never see one day. Grandchildren and great-grandchildren and possibly great-great-grandchildren, we will never know and they will never know us. And maybe one day they'll walk by and see our name and not think anything of it and some nice person will say, that was your great-grandfather. And they say, well, that's nice. And they'll walk away into their sin, into the sin that sometimes people living today bring their family into by what they do today. Jonah's sin is endangering everyone around him. Then finally this, Jonah's sin is just rebellion, isn't it? It's rebellion. Jonah deserves hell. He deserves sin. He deserves punishment because of his sin. He deserves judgment. He deserves to be cast into hell. That's the language that Jesus uses in the New Testament. Jesus uses. To be cast into hell, Jonah deserves that 100% because of his sin. And I hope today we're just beginning to see something of the seriousness of sin that Jonah was in. This is the third thing I want us to see this morning about Jonah and his sin. How did God show this rebellious prophet compassion? This is what I'll say to you this morning. Though there's many things we could say and there's many things we'll see God willing through this book. Jonah received the compassion of God because Jonah did not get his wish. What was Jonah wishing? What was he striving after? Look in verse 3 again. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. That's what he wanted. 
So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah wanted to get away from God. And God went with him. That was God's compassion to this man. Jonah was fleeing from God. And what did God do? God went with him. Jonah went down to Joppa. God was there already waiting for him. Jonah went down into the ship. God was already down in the ship in those quarters. Jonah went to sleep. God was with him while he slept. Jonah was thrown into the sea. God was with him into the sea, as we'll see much more in chapter 2. Jonah's in the belly of the fish. God is with him in the belly of the fish. Jonah comes to Nineveh to preach. God is with Jonah to preach. Jonah is sulking and angry on top of a mountain, looking down at the city that has been saved and has repented, and God is right there on the mountain with Jonah. How does God show compassion to rebels? God goes with them and woos them and draws them and convicts them all the time to come back to Him. I wonder today if that's been your experience in life. I wonder if that's been your experience. That's my experience. Though certainly sometimes we go through life And maybe some of you can think back to maybe a time in your Christian life where you backslid and you were doing things you knew you ought not to. Maybe sometimes you felt like you got away with them only to have God come back to you. And you know what? When God does things like that, it may make some people mad. They're like Jonah. They want to get away from God. They want to be done with this. They want to flee. Oh, I want heaven one day. I'll come back to you on my deathbed. They they want to flee. They want to get away from God. And all the time, they're miserable. God's knocking at their heart. God's dealing with them. What is that? That's the compassion of God to rebels. That's what it is. That's it. I remember for myself, I was, I don't know, maybe 10 years old or so, I was, I was standing in the foyer of our church building back home, and I was reading a gospel track, and I saw, wow, I am sinning just like this. And I felt the conviction of God. I didn't do anything about it, though. I remember one day, I don't know how old I was, probably a young teenager sitting in church service, my pastor preaching passionately, I'm sure, as he often did, and he was naming something, it was convicting me so bad, what did I do about it? Nothing lasting, but God was chasing after a rebel that day. I remember walking on the golf course, playing golf with my buddy, and, and, and many of you can give same testimonies. I was playing golf, and we had finished the ninth hole, and I was on the tenth hole, and we were driving in the cart, and just a beautiful day of golf, something I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in my life. And I said, turn back, i got to go. i got to go talk to my pastor. God had been knocking on my heart. God chases after rebellious men. God, it's, it's almost like this. I think it's been compared to this. It's almost like, though it's much more at times, it's almost like, have you ever got a, a, a pebble or a little stone in your shoe? And maybe it's not enough to stop and take it out, but you keep walking and you can feel it every once in a while. It turns in such a way and you don't like it, but you, you just keep going. You... That is something, and I say this reverently, that is something like the Holy Spirit working in our heart the whole time we're walking away from Him. He's there. He's dealing with us. He's convicting us. He's saying, no, you need to come back. You know, but you just try to get it away. You try to get done with it. Out of your mind. I'm I'm done with it. I don't want it. But you hear it. You hear it. That's Jonah here. Jonah's a man of God. He has sinned grievously against God. He has sinned horrendously against Him, God, and the people He's supposed to minister to, and God won't leave him alone. That's the compassion of God to rebels. God continue, continues to pursue them. He, he tugs at their heart. He deals with them. The Spirit of God works in them and brings them to repentance. I want you to turn to Revelation 14. We're going to look at a 
two verses here in just a moment. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 14. In one sense, what we're looking at this morning is the story of the Bible. It's God pursuing sinners. It's God pursuing rebels. Adam and Eve sinned. What do they do? It's amazing. Genesis 3.8, the Bible says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And what does the Lord do? He comes down to the garden and says, Adam, Adam. He's seeking after sinners. Israel goes astray. They, they, have, they have killed their own. They have rebelled against God. What does God do? He sends them prophet after prophet after prophet to warn them. And then finally, at the fullness of time, what happens? Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, comes into our world. He comes, He lives among men, He seeks men, He dies for men under the wrath of God. How did He secure our salvation for us? You may have noticed before in the Bible, whether through reading or doing a search, numerous times the Bible talks about a cup, a cup of the Lord being, being drank. Uh, to drink it. Many times in the Bible, that cup of God is speaking of the wrath of God, the anger of God. And I'll just turn there very quickly in, in 16, Revelation 16, look in verse 19. You see an example of this. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of His fierce wrath. What does that have to do with what Christ did for us? The New Testament in the Gospels, when Jesus is praying in Gethsemane, He says, Lord, if this cup can pass from Me, let it pass. Not My will, but Your will be done. Why can rebels be forgiven today? It's because Jesus Christ drank the anger and wrath of God for us as He died for our sins on the cross. Here's what I want you to see though in Revelation 14. I do want to give a warning today as we come to the end of the message. And warnings are compassionate. Any preacher who never warns is a preacher who never loves. Revelation 14 though, what I want us to see, we're talking about God's presence, we're talking about Jonah could not escape the presence of God. Here's the warning I want to give us, and it's a compassionate warning this morning. Is that whether we come to a place of repentance as Jonah did in chapter 2 of Jonah, whether we come to a place of repentance or not, we will never escape the presence of God. Verse 9 and 10. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. This is speaking of people rejecting God. Which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is a message of compassion this morning. But it would be an act of hatred to not warn that God's patience doesn't last forever. What you see in Revelation 14 is indeed the fact, and it's the fact that Jonah found out and probably already knew in actuality, that no matter where we go, what we do in life, the presence of God, it may not be favorable, but the presence of God will always be with us. There's no escaping from His presence. And what we see here are even those in hell are being tormented in Jesus' presence. That is a frightful thought. Here's what I'll say to you this morning. The same forgiveness that Jonah found 
for his grievous sin, the same forgiveness is offered in Jesus Christ for all who will repent, come to Him humbly like Jonah did, and give their life to Him. Let me say this. This is a message to Christians. Jonah's a Christian. I think sometimes and free will Baptists and Methodists and other people like that, and all people, but should know better than this. I think sometimes Christians think that just because they're a Christian now, they can get away with a few things. And it's okay to go astray a little while, like Jonah did. I think we fall into such a mindset of, of the amazing grace of God that we take that and we run to a false extreme with that. We, we do something unholy with it. We, we take it and we twist it. We take the grace of God and we turn it into a tool of lasciviousness, of sin. We take it and we just, we say, you know what? It's okay. God is a God of compassion. And I want to highlight that to us this morning because that's what the Bible says. The book of Jonah is all about God's compassion. And yet we live in 2022. And what in the mindset of many churches and preachers today is you know what? We ought to do better. But if we don't do better, everything will be okay still. We ought to do better, but we are so thankful God's a God of compassion and mercy. And boy, He's forgiving because that's His job. And what I say to us this morning is this. Yes, we are saved by grace. I am saved by grace. I am kept by grace. I lift my hands up and I say, there's nothing in my hands. I bring to you, God, it is your compassion and mercy and grace poured out on me. That's why I will be saved. Because Christ Jesus has died for me. But the same grace that saves us is the same grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness in this life. So we as Christians, and here's the bottom line of it, and I think we'll talk more about this in Jonah. The bottom line in it is this, when you think about people struggling with whether God can forgive them or not, it's not the world with that struggle. And there's exceptions to that. It's not the world today struggling at home watching HBO and watching Facebook and all this other stuff. It's not the world sitting at home wondering if God can forgive them or not. Almost all of them think He's already forgiven them. And they're okay. The problem is for Christians like you and I who really know God and walk with God. The devil will come to us sometimes and try to bring up old sins that God has forgiven us for. And one thing we are reminded of in the book of Jonah is that God is compassionate. He's long-suffering. If He can forgive Jonah, He can forgive us too. Because Christ Jesus has died for us. Amen. And amen.